Thank you for joining our New Life Bible study entitled The Good News Doctor, taught by Pastor Alan Brooks. The New Testament book of Luke examines in detail the life and ministry of Jesus and is written with the warmth and compassion of a good old-fashioned family doctor. Prepare your hearts and minds for what God has for you personally as Pastor Alan leads us in our study. Praise God for how He's using our people and their gifts right there. It's great to see you as well. I, uh, right before 11 o'clock, I looked around the room and there's like six or seven people here and I thought, oh, I guess the conviction alert from 9 o'clock went out because, uh, well, I'm not going to go hear that this morning, okay? But uh, it is a convicting message, hopefully a good message for you. This week I was looking at something. They did a contest in Michigan, and they were looking at wacky warning labels. We've all seen them. They're kind of crazy. Well, here's one of the winners. Shin pads cannot protect any part of the body that they do not cover. I mean, you know, who knew? I mean, they need to be more clear, you know, about this kind of stuff. Another one electric router, if you can't see what it is, not intended for use as a dental tool. Really? Wow, that's, that's frightening, right? And here's, here's my favorite, recycled flush water unsafe for drinking. We don't have those up in our restrooms, by the way, so just be forewarned, you're on your own in that area. Well, why, why do companies do this, though? Why do they put these crazy, wacky labels on things? Because they're worried about being sued, right? And you know, that's the culture of our world on a lot of different levels, not just at companies. You know, people are anxious, people are worried. And that, as you might imagine, has something to do with our message today. And the truth of it is that there's a lot of influences coming at us. And you need to ask yourself even this morning before we get started, is that you? Are you a person who's worried or anxious? And is that even what God would have you be? Or is there a better place that God would want you to be? We've been away from the book of Luke. We're back in chapter 12 today, if you want to go ahead and head there. But where we were a month ago before we started our Easter series is we were looking at this whole issue of this rich guy. Jesus told a parable about a guy whose fields had produced so abundantly that what was his problem? He had no place to store his grain. So what was his grand plan? You remember that? To tear down the existing storehouses and barns that he had and build bigger ones, right? And then when he did that, his plan was, I'll retire, kick back, and as I titled that message, live the good life. And even as I th think, hopefully you walked away with what that man thought the good life was and what God believes the good life is are two very different things. Today we're going to be looking at the idea of kingdom living. And might I suggest there's a contrast. There's a contrast between living the good life and kingdom living as it is that God intended for it to be. Let's jump into our text. We're actually down to verse 22. I'm reading out of the ESV or the English Standard, if that helps some of you with electronic devices. Jesus is the one speaking here. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They never, neither sow nor reap. They neither storehouse nor barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life span of life? If then you were not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Some words that some of us need to hear right now. O oh, you of little faith. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. 
For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. I was thinking about this whole idea of anxiety and worry, and if you put a warning label on it, this is how it would read. Known to cause erratic mood swings, bouts of insomnia, irritable bowel syndrome. Is that too early to say that? Okay. Uh, constipation, difficulty breathing, heart diseases, and in some cases, death. That's a real warning label. See, the truth is that worry and anxiety will do all those physical things to you. But it's worse than that. It doesn't just affect us physically, it affects us how? It affects us spiritually. The word in the original, merimao, means to have an anxious concern, often based on apprehension about possible danger or misfortune. The root of the word for anxious is the same as the root for worry. They're kind of identical twins, if you will. Now, Jesus here says, don't be anxious. Let me ask you a question. Do you think he was intending this as a suggestion to his disciples? Command, maybe. Command, yes. Okay? It's not a suggestion. The irony, though, is that if you were to ask most Christians if worry and anxiety were a sin, you know what they would say? Most Christians would say no. They just think that's what everybody does. People worry. People get anxious. But the Bible tells us if we're told what not to do and we do it, it's sin. And Jesus, not just here but in other places, commands us not to be anxious and not to worry. Back to the spiritual point, why is that? What does it show? It shows a lack of faith, a lack of trust in, in Him, in God. It's a ditz on God when we worry and get anxious. We're saying, God, I don't know that I can trust you, so i got to really get concerned about this thing. That's really what we're doing, whether we like it or not. By the way, you could stop right here and walk out those doors if you would like, but if you left with that thought alone and chose to start confessing that in your life when you do it, it would make a total difference in your life. Because what some of us need to do is we need to catch those thoughts on the front end of being anxious and worried. And we need to say, no, this is not right. I'm being disobedient to God in doing this. This is sin. We need to agree with God about what that is and turn away from it. Would that change your life if you did that? Oh, I guarantee you it would. Now, I speak as a person with a lot of experience, sadly, in this area, because I'm a person who, in my life, has had a lot of bouts with anxiety and worry, uh, leading even to depression, as I've shared with some of you before. And so what we're talking about today are the words of our Lord and his encouragement about this idea of kingdom living. But notice how Jesus frames this, because here he's saying not to be anxious about food and clothing. Now, as I look around the room, you know, you're all well clothed, you're not naked, thank you for that, by the way, okay, Uh, because it would be very awkward for the rest of us. So I'm guessing that you don't really have a lot of challenges with clothing. In fact, as I look around the room, it doesn't look like you're starving that much either, okay? I bet if I went to your house and looked in your pantry, we'd find plenty of food in there. Would I be right? So don't miss who Jesus is addressing this to, because it's real quickly for us to do this and go, hey, I don't worry about food and clothing. But he's talking to men and women who have left everything, their jobs, their homes, their possessions, to do what? Follow him around for the last three years. For them, food and clothing represented provision and protection. Well, when we frame it with those words, that becomes a little different for us, doesn't it? Because we do have worries about certain kinds of provisions. We worry about a roof over our head or being able to pay for the roof over our head, right? The provision of a vehicle to take us to and from the places that we need to go. We often get anxious about those sorts of things. We sometimes get anxious, especially in a culture that's growing more and more violent, about what? 
protection, right? Whether we're going to be safe or not, whether we have a gun stashed in all the best places in our house and vehicles and all that or whatever we do. We spend more time thinking about these things than we allow ourselves to believe a lot, that we really do become anxious about provision and protection. Notice what Jesus asked his disciples. He said, can being anxious add an hour to your life? Notice that he says that that's a small thing. <laughs> to add an hour to your life, <laughs> that's nothing. It's a small thing. But when he's asking the question, can it add an hour to your life, being anxious, what's the understood answer? No, it can't. Corey Tim Boom said these words, which I thought were very valuable. Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. So where anxiety can't add anything to our life, it can sure take our life away. And yet we allow ourselves to continue in that sin. Jesus gives some examples to consider. He talks about the ravens. The ravens are scavengers. That means they eat dead things. Now, somebody came up to, the, to me after the service, the last service we had, and they said, uh, so tell me about your diet. And he says, you don't eat dead things too? And I'm like, well, I guess I hadn't thought about it that way. I am kind of a scavenger of sorts, right? Especially at a good buffet. But for the people in this culture, being a scavenger meant that the bird was unclean. It was practically useless to a Jewish person, these ravens. But what God is saying, and I love the way the message puts this, they are carefree in the care of God. Gosh, that's true of the ravens, these very common birds. In fact, where we we live, we see lots of them. They're huge, you know, three, four foot across wingspans. They're carefree in the care of God. Does that describe you? Do people look at you and go, wow, wow. She's carefree in the care of God. I don't know about you, but I would like people to look at me in that way. Not as a raven, to be clear, okay? But as someone carefree in the care of God. He talks about the grass and the flowers. He says, walk into the fields, look at the wildflowers. This is translated again by the message. They don't fuss with their appearance, but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? I was talking with some friends visiting from, well, new friends, I guess, if I can call you that. But they're traveling through from Dallas to the Northwest. And one of the things that I absolutely love about the Northwest this time of the year is the hillsides of the mountains are flush with this green grass and wild flowers growing everywhere. And we were talking about this place called the Enchantments, which is renowned for this beauty that's there. But again, what's the point? Are the flowers and the grass fussing? over that stuff? No. God just does it. His instruction to his disciples, again, I think an instruction to many of us, oh, you of little faith. Here again, the message just does a beautiful job with this, verse 29. And it says, what I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax. That's what some of you need to do today. You need to relax. Not be so preoccupied with getting Notice this part, so you can respond to God's giving. Do you see your life that way? Wildflowers, grass are responding to God's giving and radiating in beauty. And here we are scurrying around like chickens with our heads cut off, right? He makes, I think, an intended contrast here when he talks about the nation's The word is sometimes translated from its original into the word Gentiles, which referred to heathens or pagans or unbelievers. And his contrast is this, the children of the world, unbelievers, they seek after these things. They get all consumed about these things. But what's he trying to say about the children of God? Should we? Absolutely not. That's what the world's doing. We should be different. Do you realize that part of what the world needs to see in the church 
is they need to see people that are living like the ravens, carefree in the care of God, where they can go, you know what, I want what he has. I want that smile like she has on my face because I know that God's got it. God's got me covered. Do you think people would be attracted to God more frequently if that were the case rather than looking like somebody just ran over our cat? Now, some of you look like that. You laugh if you run over your cat. But, I mean, some people here like cats. So, to be. The point I want you to walk away with today is the kingdom living is a life in which our father takes care of his kids. Take that to the bank. God, your father, if you're one of his kids, he knows your needs. And like the lilies, we shouldn't be fussing over our appearance. Like the ravens, we should be absolutely carefree in his care. Now, with that said, let's talk about what I think are sometimes some misapplications that I've heard about this idea. Because Jesus says the ravens don't plant or harvest, they don't build storehouses, the lilies don't toil and spin. And I've heard people say, hey, I have no need to work. I'll just sit around and wait for the checks to come rolling in. Is that Jesus' point? No, that's not his point at all. And unfortunately, people will take that kind of application to it. Here's another point that I believe goes with the first point. Kingdom living is not an entitlement system. God hasn't given the ravens the ability to build barns and storehouses to plant and harvest, has he? Has he given us that ability, though? Absolutely. God gave us the ability to work. Unless we have some kind of disability that prevents us from doing so, there's an expectation that we're doing our part. And have you noticed the same thing I've noticed? When you work, when you labor, you always feel good afterwards. To me, it's kind of like exercise. You know, when I go, go to the gym, you know, a lot of times I'm driving, I'm like, eh, I don't want to go, I think I'll skip it today. But I almost always stop. You know why? Because I've learned that going makes me feel better afterwards. Work does the same thing. The fact that we've worked with our hands, we've worked with our minds to accomplish what God's given us the ability to do makes us feel who it is that God's created us to be. Don't forget, we were created in God's image, right? God himself is a worker, creator, right? And that's one of the times when we're most like him is when we're working and we're creating. I saw a news clip this past week that was really sad and, and discouraging. It was a woman that was holed up in a very small motel room. You know what I'm talking about? Those little kind of skid row motel places. She was holed up in this room with 15 children, all her kids. And one of the things that she was telling the reporter was, somebody needs to take responsibility for these kids. I was just saddened by that. I was saddened because in her mind, she was living life how she was choosing to live it with her liberties, yet she was expecting that her liberties now were somebody else's liability. It doesn't work that way. If you just want to sit around and wait for the checks to come in, that's not going to happen. That's not the way God works. Kingdom living is not an entitlement system. What you will discover is as you do the things that God's created you to do, then God's going to turn around and bless you for having done those things. That's the way his system works. And the reality is we've got a whole culture out there today that are into the idea of entitlement. It's incredibly sad. I felt horrible for those children. They're growing up in an environment where this mother's brought them into the world through her sexual lifestyle, but yet now feels like somebody else should take care of them. And if they don't, it's their fault, not their mother's fault. Or their father or fathers, whoever's bailed on them from that end of it. It's sad. It's incredibly sad that our world, in fact, I would say our government is creating that kind of system. I was kind of half tongue-in-cheek this week talking to somebody saying, you know, they ought to change the domain name for all the government sites that say .gov, change it to .god, because that's what they're trying to convince the world they are. Hey, we're God. We'll take care of you. Just come to us. We'll take care of you. 
Do you think the true God wants people going to the government to take care of them? No. God wants to take care of us, but we have to be willing to go to him with the gifts that he's given us. Let's go back to our passage in verse 31. So he's saying, don't be anxious about anything. He says, instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Don't miss that. Instead of being anxious, seek his kingdom. And he says, if you do this, these things will be added to you. This is similar to a teaching that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew records it as also including some other information I think that's helpful for us. There he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. What does that mean, first of all, above all else? Highest priority. There is no greater priority in your life as a child of God than to seek his kingdom. Matthew also says, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. One of my discoveries, and some of you have found this as well, is God may not give me everything you want, or everything I want, but he is faithful to give me everything I need. I've never lacked for provisions. I've never lacked for his protection. In fact, I've been in some dangerous situations where I almost felt like the old uh, Star Trek thing where they had the force shield, you know, that you could just kind of walk through in the midst of all the bad stuff going on and God had you covered, right? That's the kind of God that we have. But what's this idea of living righteously? Let's flesh that out for a minute. Kingdom living, first of all, is a life built on God's ways. Newsflash, not man's. Our whole world is trying to re-decide what's right and wrong and redefine it according to man's ways rather than God's ways. I like what Paul wrote in the passage we call Romans R14 verse 17 there he says the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit if you want to live a life that's truly a life of peace and joy it starts with an acknowledgement that you've got to be at peace with God Because until you're at peace with God, you're going to be at war with him and everything else, right? And the way it starts with you being at peace with God is you've got to believe that simple truth that Jesus is the one sent by God to reconcile the breach that was between us and him so that we can have a right relationship together. We can be at peace with God. We're no longer at war with God. Sometimes we call that in the church, believing that Jesus is our Savior. But it can't just stop there. We've also got to believe that He is the Lord. That we're willing to submit ourselves to His authority and live life according to His ways rather than our own. Not about you, but I find that difficult sometimes. You find that sometimes your ways aren't quite God's ways? And when we're faced with that dilemma, we have a choice, every one of us. Are we going to go his way? Are we going to go our way? My discovery, hopefully yours as well, has been that every time I go my way, things don't go quite so well. But I also discover that when I do things his way, life goes better. That's this idea of living righteously, to live according to the goodness of God. I'll never forget when I first came to Christ. Some of you know I didn't grow up going to church. Uh, By the time I was about 17 years old, I'd only been to church a couple of times in my whole life. That wasn't something our family did. But at a certain point, I read about Jesus going to the cross, giving his life so that I could have a new life. And you know what? 
I was silly enough to believe that. And it changed my life. I went from being a person who was consumed with worry and anxiety that was in constant depression to having a joy and a peace that I could not even start to describe because I had moved the focus from myself to him and to what he had done. And it was radical. Even people that knew me like, wow, what happened to you? You're just like happy and joyful all the time. You know, I was like, wow, <laughs> gave my life to Jesus. You know, I didn't even know what that looked like. I just knew something was different. The Holy Spirit had come to live inside of me, and now I was looking to what God wanted. I wanted to be a part of His ways, His kingdom, rather than being focused on my own kingdom. Do you see a difference there? you see a difference in how God would call you to live? Get your eyes off of you. Stop worrying about me, myself, and I. If you haven't thought of it and you haven't heard this before, to me I call that the unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. And that is where a lot of people worship. Me, myself, and I. We think about it. We're consumed about it. Rather than going, wow, I worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he dwells within me. I love these words here in our text in Luke where he says, Fear not, little flock. Matt shared this with me yesterday, but my thought for you here is that kingdom living is a life of a kuna matata. Now, I've got to tell you, I had to have him explain what that meant because I just didn't know. Who here knows what it means? No worries, right? Swahili. No worries. Kingdom living is no worries. This passage here, fear no Fear not, little flock, reminded me of Psalm 23, one of our favorites, I know, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd. You remember these words? I have all that I need. That's a truth for you today. If the Lord is your shepherd, you have all that you need. He lets me rest in green meadows. If your life is chaotic right now, whose fault is that? Is that God's or is that yours? Help me. It's yours. That's on us, right? He gives us rest if we're willing to receive it. He leads me beside peaceful streams. What a beautiful imagery that is, right? This living water of walking right alongside God, renewing my strength. He guides me along right paths. And the purpose of all of this is to bring honor to His name. Don't leave here today without remembering that your Father is a good, good shepherd. That you are, if you're part of His family, you're part of His little flock. And that because of that, your life should be this hakuna matata. One of no worries. It's got, God's got it. How do we practically seek his kingdom, though? Let's drill that down a little bit. I think in our passage that Jesus is anticipating the question being asked by his disciples. Because notice right after he says all this, he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Wow, that's a pretty strong statement. I think you would agree. For those of you that haven't really studied this theme, it's a common theme in Luke. It starts all the way back with John the Baptist. When John the Baptist was out in the wilderness as this forerunner to Jesus, he was proclaiming this message, and he says, live your lives to demonstrate that you've turned from sin and turned to God. And the people said, what must we do? And one of the things that John said was this. If you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. I've got to tell you that when when I read that this week, I got up from my desk where I study, and and I went to my closet, 
and I actually counted my shirts. And I, and I mean all of them, not just my more dressy shirts, but even my T-shirts. Now, don't judge me, okay? But I had 70-plus shirts in my closet. Now, the reason I tell you not to judge me is if you do, then I want to go look at your closet, okay? <laughs> Maybe it isn't shirts, ladies. It could be those shoes, right? I wish it had said shoes because I don't have very many shoes, right? But I was blown away. Here I have 70 shirts, and I'm not a clothes guy, okay? How we've moved in our culture from where 2,000 years ago to have two shirts was a form of wealth, and today, a person like myself, I don't consider myself wealthy with 70 shirts. But in so many ways, we are, are we not? All three of the synoptics, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, include a story about a rich man as well who asks Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. He indicates to Jesus that he's lived righteously. He's obeyed the commandments. And Jesus follows it up was something that many of you have heard, and he says, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Do you remember what the rich man did? He walked away sad. The passage tells why he was sad, right? Because he had a lot of stuff. In fact, Jesus followed it up by said how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. We see in Acts as well, written by Luke, that they sold possessions in the early church to share with the others who had need. So here we are 2,000 years later with what I think is a, pun intended, million-dollar question. Should we? Should we be selling our possessions? I've got to tell you, it's a very hard teaching. As I studied it this week, I went to see what a lot of other Bible commentators had to say about this. You would be surprised how many of them skip right over that verse and move on. They don't even want to talk about it. I get it. It's hard. What does it mean? Is he serious about that? Do I sell just all 70 but one? Or I mean, what, what am I doing there, right? John Calvin, in fact, the, the great man from the Reformation, part of what he said was that um, it's not intended to be interpreted literally, but figuratively, that, it, that it's a matter of the heart. But let's be careful that we don't too quickly go there. Should you sell your possessions? Frankly, I don't know. But here is what I do know. What I do know is that you, as well as myself, we need to talk to God about it personally. And you need to ask God what he thinks about it. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like the rich man who tears down his barns and goes to build bigger ones. And God is looking at me as a fool. Because I'm building up treasure for myself in this life. I also don't want to be like the rich man who walks away sad because my possessions are not owned by me, I'm owned by them. See, the problem for the rich man and the reason Jesus wanted him to sell all of it is because they were his God. His whole life was wrapped up in his stuff. Again, it's easy for us to argue sometimes, well, that's not me, I'm, I'm, I'm not materialistic. Let me help you with that. Every one of us are materialistic to some degree or another. It's just how far gone are we when we would be unwilling to leave our stuff if God told you you needed to. For the rest of us, I would say that kingdom living is a life seeking to be more and more generous. Jim Elliott, some of you know him as the missionary who went out to the, I'm trying to remember the name of the Indian, Inc, not Inca, it was another one close to that. But anyway, he lost his life on the mission field for it, and he was famous for saying these words. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
Do you think he had a right perspective on giving up everything so that he could carry the good news message of God to a people who had never heard it before? I've often been inspired by stories that I've read of some people within Christianity who developed what I would call a reverse tithe. Now, when we talk about a tithe in the church, let's make sure we're all understanding the same lingo, a tithe is the idea of giving a tenth, that whatever we would get, get, we would give a tenth of that back to the kingdom work. Very simple principle in the church. Well, a reverse tithe, what some people have done is they've flipped that around. William Colgate was one of these guys. What he decided to do was to live on a tenth of what he made and give the other 90% away. I got to tell you, I'm very inspired by that. I haven't achieved that. In fact, I would say I'm not even anywhere close to that. But I do, and I'm convinced for you as well that all of us need in kingdom living to learn to be more and more generous. The greatest cure to materialism is generosity. If you want to get rid of the God of materialism in your life, then you need to learn to give more generously. I like the idea of tithing. When I first got to that place myself, I can tell you that I felt a lot better about who I was in Christ because I was giving less to myself and more to the things of God. But in my life, God said he wanted me to go further. It's possible, and I'm convinced it's true for all of us, that he wants all of us to go further. You know a scary, sad certificate, cert- statistic in the church? The average Christian in the United States, do you know what we give on the average of our income? It's about 2 to 3%. Not even close to a biblical tithe. 2 to 3%. Do the math for yourself and determine for yourself, what am I? Am I laying up treasure for myself or am I tr- laying up treasure for God? That's a hard lesson, but I would tell you that it's a lesson that God would want more and more of us to deal with, to kill the God of materialism in our lives. And to Jesus' point here, kingdom living is a matter of the heart. The message, again, I think does a great way of translating this. The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be. And these are just scary words almost to me. And end up being The rich man walked away because his treasure was in this other thing, so he went where he wanted to be, and he went to a place where he was going to probably be eternally separated from God. So what should you do? First of all, realize that if this challenges you at all, that's a good thing. It's what the Bible calls conviction. Conviction is a good thing. It causes us to examine our lives and to ask ourselves, are we being faithful to the things of God or am I making life all about me and what I want in life? Anyone who's traveled this path ahead of you would tell you the same thing. When we're stingy with what God has given us, He's not going to give you anymore. He's not going to let you waste it. But when you're generous with what God has given you, God just supernaturally does what? gives you more. So you can even be more and more generous. But at each step of the journey, you have to decide, am I going to continue to be generous? Am I going to grow in my generosity? Or am I going to become more and more stingy because I have more and more stuff? You can never outgive God. And sadly, I find a lot of people in the church haven't arrived at that place yet. I got to tell you, it took me a while to get there too. It took me a while to realize that if I would trust God for my provisions and my protection, He would take care of the rest. Because ultimately, kingdom living is a life that seeks after the eternal, not the material. This verse this week really struck me, verse 32 in our passage. It says, it's the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's ironically sad if you think about it. As we're consumed with our rations and our rags, and yet our God is wanting to give us eternal riches. He's wanting to give us the kingdom. We've talked about this already here. This isn't some future kingdom. The kingdom is already. 
It's not yet fully realized, but it's already. The kingdom of God has already come and been established on this earth. And when Jesus comes back as he's promised to do so, he's going to rule and reign upon it. Right now, already, God has given us the kingdom. But we have to choose whether we're going to live with a kingdom mindset or whether we're going to continue outside of the kingdom and live in the world's ways. Don't be satisfied with earthly rags and rations when your God, your good shepherd, your good, good father is so wanting to give you the riches of the kingdom. Amen? Would you stand and let's pray? Father, as I said on the top end of this message, as you heard, it is convicting. It's, it's convicting to me, you know, when I see this simple statement that Jesus shared with his disciples to, to sell their possessions, I'm thinking most of them already had sold everything they had to follow you. And yet there was this simple truth that life wasn't about the earthly stuff, but about the eternal stuff. It was a lesson I'm confident that they learned a lesson, Father, that I'm still learning. I know that I got brothers and sisters here today, too, that they they need to learn this lesson as I do. We need to grow in our generosity. We need to kill the God of materialism in our life. We've got to see that it's not about living the good life. It's about kingdom life and kingdom living. There's a whole different economy there. It's an economy where we have a king who knows all of our needs and supplies all of our provisions and protection. Would you say we have a great king, church? What a great king you are, God. Already now, we want to be a part of your kingdom. And we also, Lord, invite those who aren't yet a part, those who for whatever reason haven't yet put their trust in Jesus, to come join us. Come be a part of the kingdom. Come live in a world that is hakuna matata, a life of no worries, a life of where we can live and know that our Father has us, a life where we live waiting for Jesus' return to take the throne, to eliminate all the stuff that's so wrong with this world today. And we get to be a part of that. Help us to search out for those eternal things. Help those who've stayed away, Lord, to have the confidence and the faith right now to put their trust in the one named Jesus. And we pray all these things to you in that name, the name above all names, Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.